The first thing we found out when we got to the colonies nearest the cluster was that the briefings had hugely downplayed the level of pirate attacks in the region. There were several other naval task forces already operating out there, and some of their squadrons had taken as much as 30% casualties. Hit-and-run attacks, a huge rise on even just a few years ago. The local system defense forces had taken just as much of a beating. Some of them were barely functional anymore. The second thing. Well, it took us a while to find out what else was wrong. At first, we were way too busy. They threw us right into a major expedition into the cluster. Two fleets, a dozen capital ships, more than 20 escorts and five squadrons of fighters, although all except ours were still using star spears. Intel had provided the location of a pirate base and now our fleet had arrived. They reckoned they finally had enough forces to launch a full-scale assault on it without stripping the border defenses bare. We went at it head on punching straight through the unmanned weapon platforms that served as the base's first line of defense. Then we slowed right down. The base was in a thicker patch of nebula, and if you weren't careful, your own mom and tomb would sandblast your hull down to paper. So the larger ships hung back, and all five squadrons of fighters advanced in one big wave. We were met by hundreds of pirate fighter craft. One moment we were looking at nothing but dust, and the next were, were surrounded by small ships and fighting for our lives. That was how the first real battle I ever fought in began. They were good. They were using a mix of star spears and the older shadow shark fighters, but they'd modded them heavily with a whole range of upgrades, and their pilots knew what they were doing. They must have taken part in the attacks on Union space, because they'd clearly fought Union ships before. They knew Union tactics and they knew the capabilities of our fighters, but only for the squadrons using star spears. They'd never fought void sabers before, and they'd never fought us. It was still fiery mayhem for a while, but slowly we managed to claw out an advantage and start whittling them down. They'd break and melt back into the clouds only to come back at as again while we were catching our breath. But we took out fighter after fighter, and eventually they couldn't hold us back any longer. We finally broke through, and they scattered. We lost ten fighters. Six pilots managed to eject, but four killed in one engagement was still a heavy blow for a squadron that had, until that point, only lost two pilots to accidents in three years of operation. Lansing, Michaels, Krasinski, and Souza. Sarah Krasinski and I had dated for a few months before I decided I didn't need the complications. I saw her void saber come apart under a hail of enemy plasma. When the battle was over, we found what they'd been defending. It was more than just a pirate base. It was a whole colony, a small city built on a planet hidden in the midst of the nebula. It was incredibly spartan, but it had all the basic amenities. There was even a school. I walked through classrooms with bright crayon scribblings on the exposed concrete walls and wondered to myself, who the hell would want to live out here? Why would anyone leave the Union just to live like this? I never got the chance to ask any of the residents because it was completely empty when we got there. They must have known we were coming, which begged the question, why had they put up such a fight for it? Well, half the answer was maybe that they were hoping that they might somehow be able to keep us from capturing their home. They might have stood a chance if we'd brought one squadron less. But we found out the other half of the answer when we got back to the Rim Colonies. Turned out the top brass hadn't left enough forces behind to guard the border, after all. While we'd been busy attacking an empty settlement, the pirates had launched a major assault on fleet headquarters for the region, an orbital space station above a colony with the imaginative name of Landfall and the space dock and storage facilities that went with it. The pirates had taken heavy casualties for their audacious gamble, but maybe 40% of the third fleet was scrap metal drifting around the system and the rest of it was shot up to hell and back. That meant we weren't going anywhere for a while. With the third fleet rendered combat ineffective, we were reduced to garrison duty. On our previous tours, we'd visited a lot of the Rim colonies, but we'd never stayed longer than it took to resupply. A few days, then we were out into deep space again to hunt down the bad guys. This time, 
we got to see what life was actually like out on the rim. And it was harsh, maybe not as bad as the pirate colony we'd captured, but there wasn't much in the way of creature comforts. And what little the people there had, they had to work hard for. Long hours, horrific conditions, meager pay. And yeah, a lot of the colonists were scumbags who volunteered to settle new worlds because they couldn't make it elsewhere in the Union. But the longer we were there, the harder it was not to notice that there were also a lot of colonists who were just regular people, regular families. They avoided us at first, just like we avoided them, but spent enough time sharing the same space, and eventually someone will strike up a conversation. And the first question I asked was, how'd you end up all the way out here? Turned out, the union had been really stretching the definition of the word volunteer lately. Then finally, at long last, I really started looking into what I'd been fighting for these past three years. It was hard to do that at first because all the material on the open net was disseminated by the Union. There was no censorship as such. But any site critical of the government quickly got flooded with bots to the point where it became unusable. The part that really shocked me, though, was that none of the facts were really secrets. It was just the way they were presented that was carefully controlled. Read the official narratives and the Rim Colonies were economic success stories that offered new opportunities to the poor and gave criminals a chance to reform. Read between the lines and talk to the people who lived there, and a different story emerged. Very few people thought to do that, though. That was what they relied on, that the vast majority would be too complacent to look. And when I finally realized what had been going on, I was ashamed it had taken me so long. It started out honestly enough. The Union organized terraforming projects, and in the early days they paid well to attract settlers out to the rim, or they at least they gave them the equipment to build themselves a real life on a rich and productive land. But as expansion accelerated, corners were cut. There weren't the resources to fund so many projects at once, and as conditions worsened, it became harder and harder to find settlers. But the Union needed the colonies to keep growing. It relied on the raw materials they shipped back. So the government had to find settlers somewhere. At first, they offered criminals a chance to go to the colonies as a legitimate route to redemption. Then, when they couldn't find enough prisoners willing to leave their old lives behind... They started pressuring them, upping their sentences for minor infractions, and reducing their privileges until they agreed to go. Some people complained, but it was too lucrative to stop. They were both solving their settlement problem and emptying their expensive, overcrowded prisons. Eventually, even that wasn't enough. They ran out of genuine convicts, and they couldn't afford to stop because the Rim Colonies were underpinning the whole Union economy by that point so they just decided to make more crimes. Previously, only serious crimes were considered eligible for the transportation program. These days you could get shipped out to the mines or the factories for just about anything, provided you were too poor to afford a decent lawyer. Petty theft, failing to insure your vehicle, a tax arrears. And when all else failed, there was always the catch-all charge of vagrancy, or in other words, being too poor for the gleaming cities of the core territories. Technically, most sentences were short, but even if you served out your prison term in a year or two, parole always came with the condition that you weren't allowed to leave your colony without the parole board's permission. And they never gave permission, which meant that your two choices were either to find work in one of the industries that made the colonies so very profitable for everyone, but the people living in them, or starve. The major employers could treat their workers how they liked, and they knew it. Ex-cons had no choice but to work for them no matter what, the wages or conditions, and if they ever stepped out of line, then the Union military was there to back them up, with all necessary force, and sometimes a little more than that, if the local thugs wearing Union uniforms felt like it. It was indentured servitude in all but name. There was no way for the people in the Rim colonies to fight back, and no way for them to go home again. But there was a third option. Leave the Union entirely. 
For decades now, there had been a steady trickle of people striking out beyond the rim, into regions like Harmony Reach and the Magellan Cluster, to escape the Union's control. Life was still harsh out there, but at least they were free. The Union wasn't happy about that. They hated losing their labor force, and nothing frightened the government more than the thought of smugglers shipping enough weapons to the Rim colonies for a full-scale uprising, so they'd been cracking down more and more in recent years, and in response, the scattered settlements out beyond the Rim had started banding together for protection, pooling their resources to build fleets that could defend them from Union attacks and even strike back and disrupt naval operations in the Rim colonies. We weren't fighting pirates, we were fighting rebels. It took me a long time to draw all that out of the locals. They were suspicious of anyone wearing a uniform for obvious reasons. But slowly, I built up the trust of a couple of people on landfall who were willing to take a risk on a young pilot with more questions than sense, and they were able to put me in touch with people who could tell me even more. The rebels had mostly come from the Rim colonies after all. They knew how to get their people in and how to hide them so they wouldn't be found. The hardest part wasn't finding the information, and it wasn't making contact with the rebels. It was pretending that I was still the same shithead kid who'd murdered hundreds of men, women, and children just because someone with more bars on their uniform had told me to. Because I hated that kid now. More than the Union. More than Colonel Karn. Or any of the other officers. I hated him with a burning passion that could have outshone a supernova. It helped a little that I knew I wasn't the only member of Raven Squadron who had that problem. Three years earlier, Dax McCain had told me that alcoholism was the better way to deal with it. I wondered what he'd say if I told him I had a third option. I also wondered who else he'd given that advice to. Talking to Dax was like trying to dance blindfolded. Each of us feeling the other out, not wanting to say anything dangerous before we were sure the other could be trusted. But eventually we came to an understanding. I knew exactly why he drank so much. And he knew more than a couple of people who felt the same way. In fact, while I'd been cruising along oblivious to everything but my own misery, Dax had been busy. He was a captain after all. It was his job to know the pilots he was responsible for and he knew that a lot of them weren't happy. I was on the deeper end of the spectrum of disgust, but most of the squadron could feel that something was wrong. It used to be that the Union would mix new recruits with seasoned veterans who weren't just experienced but reliable. If you're a young person with no life experience and you get posted with bunch of fanatics bound up in the fantasy of military brotherhood where it's the squad versus the rest of the universe, Pretty soon, their opinions will become your opinions. But they hadn't done that with Raven Squadron. They'd chosen to build the best fighting unit they could and rely on Colonel Karn to see to our morale. That hadn't worked. We were young, and goddamn were we stupid, but we weren't blind. I wasn't the only one who'd been asking questions. No one had asked quite so many questions as me, though. So far, Dax had told people to shut up and keep their doubts to themselves. The only thing he felt he could do was protect his people. But when I started talking about other options, he didn't tell me to shut up. He listened. And then we talked to other people. Who talked to other people? Nothing happened because we were risking our necks and we had to be careful. But we built up a picture of who thought what. And it turned out, we were safer than we thought. It wouldn't take that much more for the squadron to reach breaking point. The final straw on the camel's back came sooner than we'd thought. The miners on the northern continent of Landfall went on strike and blockaded the roads with the massive excavators. The strike breakers were sent in, but were driven off with a combination of improvised weapons and the fact that all the mining vehicles were built like tanks anyway. Then the colony's government called on the Union military to help, and the fleet commanders. They ordered us to do strafing runs on the picket lines to break them up. Colonel Karn personally ordered us to take out every terrorist on the ground we could see. We'd got replacements by that point for the ships and pilots we'd lost in the Battle of the Nebula, void sabers with even more upgrades. 
and a couple of pilots fresh out of the academy, the same kids we'd trained on the Void Sabers before shipping out to the Magellan Cluster. I felt sorry for them. They didn't have the burden of our sins. They were innocent, and they were being forced to choose between their lives and their souls. But they worshipped the ground we walked on. I had my qualms about it. We were leading them into serious danger after all. But if the Union could use loyalty to get its soldiers to do the wrong thing, it seemed only fair for it to nudge someone into doing the right thing. The newbies were with us. In fact, by that point, the only members of Raven Squadron who weren't with us by that point were two of the captains, and of course Colonel Karn himself. Half the squadron wanted to mutiny right then and there, hunting down smugglers and pirates they could just about justify to themselves, but shooting down miners who just wanted enough to feed their families. They'd crossed too many lines already. They weren't going to take a step further. They'd refuse the order point blank and take whatever came next, whether it was prison or a firing squad. The rest either wanted to run or were waiting to see what everyone else would do. I suggested another option. We went on the mission as the colonial government and Colonel Karn had ordered. And we fired on the picket lines, as ordered. And my God, what a sight it was! as our plasma cannons tore up machines that must have weighed 500 tons or more. Only we knew that the miners weren't in those machines anymore. I'd made contact with the rebels, and the rebels had made contact with the miners, and they'd worked out a deal. The miners would let us break up the strike, and the rebels would make it worth their while. The colonial government was pleased. The Union government was pleased, and Colonel Karn was very pleased that his experimental squadron was working out so well. Everyone was so pleased, in fact, that it wasn't long before they sent us out into the Magellan Cluster again. They'd finally scraped together enough forces to garrison the nearest Rim colonies again, properly this time, which freed up another two fleets to strike more of the pirate bases. And that included us. This time, Union intelligence took secrecy seriously. They'd finally figured out the rebels had spies all over the rim. No civilian vessels were allowed anywhere near us as we left space dock and mustered for the attack into the cluster. They carefully searched every ship leaving the system and censored any reference to fleet movements. In fact, the only way the rebels could possibly get advance warning this time would be if they had someone actually inside the fleet, which was impossible, of course. Yet somehow, incredibly, when we reached our destination, we found the enemy there waiting for us. As before, five Union squadrons advanced into the nebula. But this time, a lot more than enemy fighters suddenly appeared out of the dust. A whole battle fleet. Who the hell knew where they'd got all the ships? They'd probably had to bring together every rebel ship they could get their hands on, but they outnumbered and outgunned the Union fleet. The wave of fighters stopped in its tracks. Most of it did, that is. One squadron kept going, charging into the proverbial valley of death. Can you guess which one it was? We all heard Colonel Karn open up the comm channel. Dax put it on speaker for all of us to hear. The colonel was on the carrier rather than in a saber with us. Maybe he just wanted to be in the command center, but maybe he suspected something. He told us to pull back. Don't try to be a hero. There's too many of them, he said. Two of the captains were also screaming at us to get back to the fleet. But for some reason, at that very moment, their ships experienced freak simultaneous malfunctions that left them adrift, without calms, and unable to do anything about it. When the colonel didn't get a response, he ordered us to turn around and head back to the carrier. And when we still ignored him, he started to get really angry, shouting at us, demanding to know what the hell we thought we were doing. Dax actually answered him then. The right thing for once. At the moment we entered weapons range, there was a part of me that was worried the rebels hadn't got my full message or didn't trust it, and we were about to be obliterated but they let us glide right on through their formation and take up station alongside them. The two fleets held each other at a standoff for a while, but eventually the Union fleet withdrew. They knew they didn't have the muscle to settle this today. 
The rebels let them go, because even if they won a battle today, they'd lose a lot of their ships in a straight-up fight like this. And tomorrow, the Union would send another fleet. We defected to the rebels without even firing a shot. It's been two years since then. We joined the fight to keep the free colonies free and extend that right to the Rim colonies as well. We've fought a lot of battles, some that went well for us and some that went badly. But more often than not, we beat whatever they could throw at us. We're the best of the best after all. We've proven that, finally. Not because we passed an exam or because we got a fancy pin on our uniforms. Because we've got a cause that's actually worth fighting for now. Oh, and because we can still outshoot, outfly, and outthink any pilot from here to Harmony Reach. We've had more Union defectors join us since we left, and they say the whole fighter corps is scared to go up against us. They'll flinch if someone even mentions our name. We aren't known as Raven Squadron anymore, by the way. They call us Rebel Squadron. But the Union is still standing strong. However this war ends, it's not going to happen anytime soon. So what does it mean to make a difference? When the Union is still around, does everything we walked away from, all the sacrifices we've made, all the friends we've lost even matter? After all these years of war, I think I can finally answer that. Because what that kid who signed up for the Academy didn't understand was that it doesn't have to be a big difference to be an important one. Doing the right thing always makes a difference.